fine, and then I'll uh, I'll go dark. I'll turn my camera off. Okay. You'll still be able to hear me. Sure. Uh, but I'll just let you run with it, and I'll also throw it out to the audience because we have like a chat feed going uh, during the live stream. Uh, I can ask people that are watching, ask questions if they'd want. Okay, okay great. Um, but really looking forward to this. And we will be live in just under two minutes. Uh, when you hear me say, welcome back to Giving Day Live, that's when you know we're live. Okay, great. And then I'll introduce you and let you take it from there. Cool. Thanks again for doing this. I know it's a little early for you, so I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. But I heard birds that get up early <laughs> are the benefactors of food or something like that. Yeah, I've heard that as well. Something about worms. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think I just need Al's just stay silent because like because I think it would be super weird if I was talking <laughs> off camera. So I could ask you questions, but that would be weird. Yeah, okay. I don't think that would be that weird. Oh no? Okay. <laughs> no, not at all. Well if anything if you if you, comes, if you so. think there's some good information that uh, she could expand upon, cer certainly throw it out there. Okay. Who who's who is holding the camera? This is Lisa Cop. I think we exchanged emails about Oh that's right. Hi Lisa. Yeah hi. Okay. Um, and then Ryan and I were talking about um, if, like, she doesn't go the full hour. Normally our tours last, you know, 40, 45 minutes, and that includes some questions. Is that is that going to be an issue of any sort? No, I'm, we only have about 20 minutes blocked off for this. Oh, okay, perfect. So, that's great. So, okay. yeah, you, yeah, so, you know. Perfect. That's why I'm less inclined to, to interrupt you, and... Speaking of interrupting, here we are. We are live again back at Giving Day Live. It is 6.35 on the uh, Ithaca time zone. Uh, wherever you're watching from, thank you. I'm really excited for this next guest. Uh, this is Ryan Vega, class of 2018. Uh, yes, 20, class of 2018, that is a thing for any of you feeling a little old. Um, and Ryan is going to give us a, a little tour around the lab of ornithology. So for all the birders out there, this one's for you. Uh, I'm gonna provide minimal interruption for Ryan's tour, uh, but if you have questions, the viewers, uh, you'll notice uh, uh, a chat box right, uh, right around here, uh, down, down in that vicinity, I believe. Uh, uh, click that chat icon and send in your questions and, and we can relay them to Ryan. Uh, so, Ryan, without further ado, uh, I'll let you kind of introduce yourself and take it away. Sure. Thanks. Uh, so, I'm Ryan. I'm a sophomore here at Cornell. I study animal science. I'm an education minor. Uh, I work here at the lab as a program assistant. This is my second semester uh, in this position. So, I'll start off just by, first of all, welcoming you to this lab. <laughs> um, I'll start telling you a little bit of our history for those of you who aren't familiar. So the lab was founded almost 100 years ago by Arthur Allen, the first professor of ornithology in the United States. So he was a professor at Cornell, and he used to come out here to kind of escape. And for uh, Cornell alumni, I'm sure you understand the importance of getting away from Cornell every once in a while, uh, even though I'm sure you want to come back now. Uh, so he would come out here to, the, to our expansive woods and hike around, and he eventually oh, was able to Acquired the woods uh, and named them the Sapsucker Woods after the yellow bellied sapsucker. He, he and his friend Luis Fuertes were actually the first to identify the yellow bellied sapsucker in the Cayuga Basin. So he was able to obtain these woods and later establish a, a facility here, uh, which is over where our small feeder garden is now. I don't know if you want to. So, uh, so the first facility was actually where our feeder garden is now. And then as we began to acquire more staff and the lab grew, we started to put uh, other buildings in this general lot. Uh, and this continued and for, for quite some time. Uh, we ended up having about 12 buildings just scattered around this expanse, including some mobile trailers. 
Eventually, some of our employees no longer wanted to work in mobile trailers. And so in 2003, we opened this building. Uh, we're very proud of it. So we're happy to have you here uh, on our virtual tour. <laughs> um, so just as you're noticing our facility, I'm sure you'll see we have a lot of artwork throughout. Uh, and feel free to take all of that in, I guess. Um, so just some things I'll point out as we're going along. Uh, here's one of my favorite pieces that we have. This is called The Foundering by Mara Lin, more famous for her Vietnam uh, memorial sculpture in Washington, D.C. So this is from a larger piece called What's Missing, and it highlights, it, it highlights features of our planet that are going extinct due to humans. So this particular ring uh, plays sounds of birds and other animals that are extinct or endangered. Uh, and this was inspired by our Macaulay Library, which I'll talk about later. So uh, as we keep walking, you can see we have two very large murals on our walls. Um, I'll first talk about Jane Kim's mural. So this is called, yeah, I'm just starting with a little bit. Uh, so this is called From So Simple a Beginning. Uh, it's by Jane Kim, a former Bartell Science Illustration intern here at the lab. We commissioned her to do this, and it's actually the first mural that depicts every family of birds uh, that is in existence right now. Uh, it follows all the way, it follows the evolutionary journey of the bird, all the way to Tictolic, which was the first uh, fish with that developed limb like structures, all the way through to uh, what you're seeing now. And all of these birds are actually life size, so if you come to the lab, you can see how you measure up against a wandering albatross or a cockatoo parrot. Uh, so, and you can also find this mural online. We actually have a really cool interactive you can go to on our All About Birds website uh, that can take you through every single species that we have depicted here, uh, which is pretty interesting. And if you want to notice our other mural, this is called The Wall of Silhouettes by James Prosek. And it highlights five different habitats and species that are identifiable not by their color. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's only, all of these are only silhouette which is very interesting because it shows you the importance of being able to identify species based on morphological differences rather than color. Uh, and I always get guests saying they can't find a single bird, but I'm sure if you actually uh, look closely, you can identify more species than you think. Uh, so this is Wall of Silhouettes. And if you want to have, if you want to quote you, uh, so, this next room is the Fuertes room. As I mentioned earlier, Arthur Allen had a good friend, Luis Fuertes. Uh, Luis Fuertes was actually the second most prolific bird illustrator in the United States, uh, second only to James Audubon, but we also have some of his work, so uh, we're not too vested. So this is a study that uh, Fuertes painted for one of his good friends. And so this is actually uh, taken directly from the friend's home. And so these are all the original works. And all of these paintings have something in common. And most people can't guess it, but it's actually hunting. So Luis Fuertes' friend was a very uh, avid hunter. And so all of these birds are either common game species or they're bird known for their hunting skills. So one of the reasons that we have such a close tie with art here at our lab is because Art has always gone hand in hand with science. You know, before there were cameras and uh, other ways of getting pictures of observation, scientists had to draw what they saw. Uh, in fact, some, some scientists even hired illustrators to come with them on trips to make sure that they were getting uh, accurate depictions of everything that they found. Also, the world of birds is beautiful. Uh, there's no denying that there is beauty in species, and so we like to keep that highlighted here at the lab. So behind the scenes, uh, and this is the first stop, and this is our Museum of Vertebrates. So the Museum of Vertebrates has 1.6 million specimens in its collection. Uh, they are all behind these walls going down on the right. They're just behind these four walls are uh, all of our fish species. So there's 4.5 miles of shelving back here that have jars and jars and jars of pickled fish. Uh, it's, the director of the lab actually called it a, 
a library of fish. Uh, if you can imagine, we have these sort of deep decimal system that we can find these fish through. And uh, there's very important reasons that we have this kind of collection. So first of all, this collection is very important for studying evolution and studying uh, morphological change. We at the lab actually have scientists in our polar lab that study using these specimens. Uh, this is also very important for art. So we have artists from all over the place coming and using our specimen as models for their depictions. And we'll step into our teaching lab and you can see some examples of the specimen that we have here at the lab. So this is our teaching lab. Uh, this is sort of an extension of the Museum of Vertebrates. Uh, here we actually have some Cornell classes that come and learn here, uh, like our, our vertebrates class, our herpetology class my borrow specimen. Uh, and as you can see, just from kind of looking around at what we have on display, a lot of these specimen are preserved for, for display. This is not the kind of uh, setup that we would have back behind those walls just because these take up a lot of space. Most of our, like for instance, our birds are stuffed with their wings pinned down to them uh, rather than like perched on a branch. Um, and as I said, all of our fish are kept in jars, you know, they're not really preserved like uh, that sturgeon over there. Um, and as I was mentioning with art, uh, over there we actually have a shoe bill that was used by Jane Kemp. So if you take a look at the mural later on, uh, he is the model for that painting. So uh, he's kind of a star. I don't want to brag, but uh, uh, we also have another way that we use our uh, museum as a teaching method is actually, for instance, uh, we might use this, like a skeleton like this, to introduce students to uh, using observation to identify animals. So, you know, you would ask, what is this skeleton? And uh, nobody really guesses it. Uh, and then you kind of look through and you say, well, what features does it have? And people say, uh, you know, it has fins or uh, legs. Sometimes they guess it's an alligator because it has teeth. But then you point out that it doesn't have any back feet. Uh, and that usually stumps people for a little bit. They think it might be a fish. Uh, but you point out that it has a spinal column. So it probably has a neural tube and it was probably a vertebrate. And then eventually we do land on dolphins. So this is actually a skeleton of a dolphin. But that is... Uh, kind of a lower level example of what we would be learning here, but it's a great way to get students interested. And a lot of times on our tours, we have kids coming in. So this is a great way to show them an introduction to kind of science uh, and the methods that we use when we're studying here. So, sorry, it's like awkward. Uh, so if we're stepping back out, uh, I will take us by some of our other departments. So we'll stop quickly and talk about one of my favorite parts of the lab of ornithology. Uh, this is Ralph. Ralph is a 19 foot reticulated python as a skeleton, uh, but she was actually more like 22 feet uh, when she still had all of her muscles and uh, skin. Ralph was actually obtained by a professor at Cornell, uh, Reed McJunk and his father. So his father, Mr. McJunk, was out hunting in the Philippines and he was with Filipino guides, they couldn't communicate very well. So one night they were sitting by the fire and the guides started pointing at a tree uh, and were gesturing wildly. And Mr. McJunkin didn't know what to think, he couldn't understand them, so uh, intuition led him to shoot blindly into the tree. Uh, I can't explain that, it's not science, so uh, not a recommendation. But he shot blindly into the tree and heard a large thud, the kind of thud that only a 19 foot 600 pound articulated python could make falling out of a tree and was far too scared to look at it. So they all went to bed. And the next morning they went and found Ralph here, sprawled out underneath. And the next dilemma was they wanted to bring her to, to the United States, but uh, she was 600 pounds and 20 feet long. And so they set her on an anthill uh, that was much, much larger than I am uh, and continued on their hunting trip. When they returned, Ralph was completely uh, eaten to bone, and they collected most of the bones. You can see some gaps. Uh, they didn't do a great job 
but uh, they collected most of the thousand bones and brought them back to America, which then led them to uh, constructing Python, which Mr. Rejecki could not do. So Ralph stayed in a box for quite some time and uh, was given to Mr. Rejecki's son, Reed, who then donated her to us, and we put her back together. To give you an idea of how long that took, it took about a month to separate the left and right ribs. Uh, so it was quite an ordeal. Uh, we're very happy to have her. A lot of people ask why why is Ralph a girl? Um, why is Ryan a girl? <laughs> These are things I can't explain. Uh, so as we keep walking, uh, we'll see our fuller evolutionary lab. Uh, this is where we do kind of the stereotypical hard science uh, when you think of microscopes and uh, lab coats and such. So in here is where we're studying particularly evolutionary biology. We're doing this at the molecular level, which is very cutting edge uh, in science right now. We're specifically looking at the divergence of species, uh, when they diverged and why. A lot of times prior to having this kind of technology, evolution was more observational. For instance, with Darwin's finches, you see two birds that are eating different things but look similar. So you know that they're related, but they're not the same species. Here, uh, this is all one family of birds, and some of them look far more similar than they're actually related. Like for instance, our umbrella birds are actually pretty distinct considering how similar they look to each other. Uh, and this is pretty, pretty crazy uh, in science. Uh, it was a very exciting discovery to have happened here. And we took this information actually and have just, uh, someone from the lab of ornithology has just published uh, the most updated list of actually family deviations. So it's, it's the closest thing we have to showing how related species are. And there were some shocking findings in there. So I encourage you to look that up if you have the chance. It's on our website. Um, very interesting. Uh, for instance, the hummingbird is most related to uh, like the whippoorwill. That was, doesn't make a lot of sense, but uh, it's the truth. So as we keep walking, uh, you'll notice that we have all kinds of posters on the wall. This is a lab, so we're constantly publishing new, new findings and new studies. So this is always changing back here. So if you ever get the chance to come, I'm sure it'll be very different. Uh, and as I've said, on our website, we have all of these things published and accessible to everybody. So it's a great way if you're interested to learn more about uh, what we have going on here. So now we're going through our kitchen. <laughs> But uh, we're approaching our next two stations, which are both, they both deal with the science of sound. So we have our Macaulay Library and we have our Bioacoustics Research Lab, which use sound in very, very different ways. Our Macaulay Library is what we're getting to first. That actually is the largest collection of biodiversity media in the world. And so we have, it's all collections of sound and video, and we have uh, about 75% of the species of birds covered in our collection, which is a huge number, um, as well as other animals. And this is a growing collection. So we're continually obtaining new information, uh, either from our own researchers or uh, other sound technicians that are giving their findings to us. Uh, and this collection is not publicly available yet, but we're hoping eventually that it will be accessible. Uh, on the other side, we have our bioacoustics research lab. And so this is using sound uh, through to as conservation. So we have two big projects that I'd like to highlight, our endangered forest elephant project and our North Atlantic gray goat project. So our forest elephant project uh, takes place in Central Africa and we're taking microphones, uh, you can see a picture here, we're placing microphones up in trees in the jungle and trying to track elephant populations. Most people think an elephant is so large you can easily find one, but actually uh, it's very difficult to spot an elephant in these jungles. So using sound technology, we can track exactly where they are, uh, not only with their loud trumpets, but elephants communicate with kind of a low rumbling noise. Uh, and that is very easily picked up by our microphones. So using that, we can track if there's any poaching going on, we can inform the governments about uh, perhaps not developing in certain areas where elephants might be more dense. Uh, and this is something that Cornell students can actually get involved with. There's a club on campus called Elephant Ears, and they actually come here and volunteer and listen to these tracks and try to find when elephants are making noises, uh, which really speeds up the process for our researchers. 
Um, our other big project that I'd like to talk about is our North Atlantic right whale conservation program uh, because it's fairly close to home, uh, North Atlantic, if you could guess. Uh, they actually come as close to um, Ellis Island, so they're right in our neighborhood. And these whales are very, very endangered. There's actually only around 400 individuals left in the wild. And this is almost entirely because of humans. So these whales travel by and communicate through sound. And so as you can see on this poster, all of these uh, dots are one whale. Uh, and this is like measuring sound by color. So the brighter the color, uh, the more sound they're producing. And this picture is one boat moving through the same area. So as you can see, so as you can see, uh, it's kind of like somebody was talking to you on the phone and started shouting in your ear, uh, they can't communicate. So this causes either collisions or separation from calf and mother. Uh, so we're placing microphones out into the water and then we have a listening station in Massachusetts that's actually uh, informing boats and informing local docks uh, when whales are present and advising them to either move their paths uh, or perhaps cut their noise when they're traveling through certain areas. Uh, the good news is this is working. So uh, slowly but surely, we're hoping that the population will start uh, to come back. But this technology is very useful in other in other scenarios. We also use it to kind of do environmental impact reports out of the ocean. Uh, and as I said, this technology is very similar to the, to the elephant technology. They're both using low frequency, uh, but a very different. So I'm not sure what that noise is, but. Uh, uh, we'll keep walking. We're almost done with our tour, so um, as we're walking through, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the other departments at our lab that are upstairs. We're not going to go look at all of our cubicles today, but uh, some very important work happens. So first of all, we have uh, our education department, which is divines, de designs formal and informal curriculum. So for instance, we have a program that is an introduction to birding and to the world of birds for anybody that's accessible to take, it's designed like a college course, but uh, you do not have to be enrolled in college to take it. It takes about a semester is what it's designed for, but uh, some students have taken up to 20 years actually to finish the course. At the end of those 20 years, they are still just as qualified as the other students. So there's no shame in taking your time. Uh, we also have some programs that we use in school. So for instance, we have our bird sleuth program, which is an introduction to the scientific method for elementary school students. And it takes them all the way actually through uh, the research publication step, which is pretty cool. Uh, they're actually able to like upload their information to a database. Uh, it's very interesting and a great way to get students exposed to research. Uh, we also have our citizen science department. And for those of you who don't know, citizen science is the concept of gathering large amounts of data from the general public to be used in scientific research. So we actually have one of the largest, if not the largest, citizen science programs in the world, eBird. And I encourage you all to check that out. eBird is uh, a large online database where you can upload your bird sightings every day uh, and they get logged and we can use them to study bird population, we can study migration movements, uh, et cetera. And we get about five and a half million uploads per month. So it's a huge amount of data, uh, impossible to collect as a researcher alone. Uh, it's very important. This concept of citizen science is something that in almost all of our research, it's very important. Uh, and so I definitely encourage you to take all that out right? because it really needs your help. Uh, and I think it's kind of very interesting. Um, I think yeah, Ryan, I think I think we're going to have to wrap up now. That was uh, just an absolute uh, flurry of information in, in, in all that time. So thank you so much for, for such a thorough tour and uh, very informative and, and enlightening. And uh, we certainly want to encourage uh, alumni that are uh, Cornelians that are watching on Giving Day here to uh, consider supporting the, the all the work that the Lab of Ornithology does because it's it's some of the most impressive work in their field, if not the most impressive. And be sure to swing by Sap Sucker Woods when you come back to campus for reunion or any visits that you make. It's it's just getting to be the good season out there now. So, um, Ryan, thanks again so much. Um, 
uh, and we wish you the best of luck in, in your research. And uh, we can, it, it's not, not hard to tell you're, uh, you're going to go on to some good things and we look forward to, to seeing everything that you're able to accomplish. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we'll talk to you soon and we'll be right back in about three minutes when we do with another tour. This time we're going over to the CU Dairy Plant and we'll see you over there. <laughs> 